Hi, my name is Sarah Bunin Benor. I'm Associate Professor of Contemporary Jewish Studies at Hebrew Union College in Los Angeles. And I'm happy to present this video about American Jewish language and identity. Enjoy. I'd like to welcome everybody to the third in the Center for Jewish Studies series on the American Jewish experience. I'm Claude Fisher, Professor of Sociology at Berkeley. I'm also a member of the Center for Jewish Studies. And I'm very glad to have you all here to hear our speaker. Our speaker is Professor Sarah Bonin Benor. She's an Associate Professor of Contemporary Jewish Studies at Hebrew University College in Los Angeles. She is an active leader in research, the research community studying Jews and Jewish language, which is no doubt a very complex and uh, entertaining uh, uh, way to do work and subject to study, and I'm very eager to hear about it. Her 2012 award-winning book, Becoming Froom, How Newcomers Learn the Language and Culture of Orthodox Judaism, is not only an important book, but it's also available for sale outside. Not only has she studied the language of the Froom, she's also written about the language of the Reform Sisterhoods. So it seems to me that Sarah's covered the entire range of Jewish jabber. And with that, I'm glad to introduce Sarah Benor. I like that, the entire range of Jewish chatter. I'm gonna use that as my Twitter handle or something like that. Um, okay, well, thank you very much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. And uh, today I'm gonna be talking about Jewish American English. What is it, who speaks it, and why, and how is it changing? And I'm gonna start with some characteristic quotes. And I'm gonna ask you to tell me who might say such quotes. I can't believe Jeremy co-chaired the campaign. He's always been a mensch, and now he's a real macher. You must be shepping so much naches right now. Who might say that? My grandmother. OK, right. So maybe an older woman involved in the Jewish Federation system. Uh, how about this one? The sugya we're learning is too lumdish to say outside. Yeshivish, right. So this would be maybe young Orthodox guys. OK. <clears throat> oh, and sorry, that's a book called uh, The First, From Speak, The First Dictionary of Yeshivish. <laughs> After I was bat mitzvahed, I only went to temple for tikkun olam events. <laughs> a reform Jewish girl, a woman, right? Um, good. How about this one? The Gabbai wants to know who's laning the Maftir Aliyah and who's Hagba and Galila. Conservative. Conservative. It could be modern Orthodox. It could be um, it could be a um, independent minion, right? And and so Jewish Jews who are actively engaged in religious life. I spent the whole party schmoozing up the presidents. I must I must have given my spiel six times. What? A peninsula techie. OK, good. So, so not, not necessarily Jewish, right? And so notice this is using Yiddish words, but in a distinctive way, not necessarily in the way that many Jews would use them. And lastly, this one. In the middle, the coldest weather, he crossed the ice in a little boat. He should catch the British and the missionaries fooling around, not with their minds on the war. <laughs> okay, well, this is actually from a book called The Education of Hyman Kaplan by Leo Rostin, and it's the kind of thing you'd hear from an immigrant who speaks Yiddish as his or her native language, right? Okay, so all of these quotes are different from each other, right? You, it would be unlikely to hear one person who said one quote saying any of the other quotes. So this leads us to the conclusion that when we talk about Jewish American English, it's, a, it's an abstraction. It's an umbrella term for the ways that Jews in America speak English. Now, this is not just a Jewish thing. This is the case with other dialects of ethnic groups like black English, Latino English, that kind of thing. These are umbrella terms that represent a great deal of diversity and variation. And it's also the case with other Jewish languages. When we talk about Judeo-Persian, Judeo-French, other Jewish languages, 
Judeo Malayalam, in case you're wondering, is spoken in southern India. Um, and, and so when we talk about these languages, they are also umbrella terms representing a good deal of diversity. Now, to give you a sense of how American Jews distinguish themselves from each other through language, I'm going to give you some data from a survey that I conducted with Stephen Cohen in 2008. And I understand there's someone here who took my survey. OK, thank you. Um, along with 40 or 50,000 other people, it was a really, it, it, we started out by sending it to about 600 people and asked them to forward it around, the, the snowball method it's called. And it worked. It, we got over 40,000 responses. <clears throat> So, and the, the data that I'm going to give you today come from 20-something thousand responses from Jews who grew up in America and currently live in America and whose native language is English. Okay, so um, what we found was that there was a lot of diversity in the use of Hebrew and Yiddish words and other distinctive language features according to age, religiosity, denomination, Israel connections, and how many Jewish friends they have. So let me give you some examples. The word macher means big shot. You saw it in one of those quotes. It's a Yiddish word, and it's declining. That is, younger Jews are, are much less likely than older Jews to use this word, right? Um, and can you think of other words that might be like that? Other Yiddish origin words used in English mostly by older Jews. Schnorr, good. Schlamazel. Knedlach, good. Now these words I didn't test on the survey, but I imagine they would follow the same pattern as this one. But with some other words, we see the opposite pattern. The word drosh from Hebrew, you see, is the opposite, that younger Jews are much more likely than older Jews to use it. Surprisingly, we also find this with some Yiddish words like shul and bench and daven and that's very interesting because these are Yiddish origin words that you would expect to also be declining based on the generation from immigration, but they're actually increasing because of their prominence within the religious communities. We also see that with an expression from Yiddish, staying by us, meaning staying at our house. And that is, is in is the opposite of declining, it is increasing significantly. If you look at just orthodox respondents, you see that something like 90% of the youngest group use it compared to 20-something percent of the oldest group. Okay, so that's age. Let's turn now to religious observance. This is synagogue attendance. And we see, you would expect words that are related to the synagogue, like Aliyah and Gabai and Hagba and Galila to be to correlate with synagogue attendance. But we also see this with other words, like tachlis. Here you see that those who rarely attend synagogue rarely use the word tachlis compared to those who attend frequently. And <clears throat> we see the same thing with denomination. Those who report using the word davka, which is very hard to translate, uh, it kind of means specifically or intentionally, it correlates very strongly with denomination. Reform Jews are much less likely to use it than Orthodox Jews. And if we look just within the what I call the Orthodox continuum, that is modern Orthodox, Orthodox, and black hat Orthodox, which, which includes Hasidic, Hasidic Jews and Yeshivish Jews, you see that there is a trend toward the use of sukkis more in the more right wing uh, orthodox groups, Sukkot as opposed to Sukkot for the holiday in the fall. Um, and then when I asked, how do you pronounce the phrase that is used between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur? I pronounce it Gmar Chatima Tova. It means, may you be sealed for good. Um, and the there was a, a very strong correlation along the orthodox continuum from the way I just said it to Gemar Chasima Toiva. So you see the more Yiddish influence on the right side of that continuum. We also see correlations with time spent in Israel. The word Balagan, which comes originally from Slavic, then into Yiddish, then into Israeli Hebrew, and then into Jewish English, correlates very strongly with the amount of time an individual has spent in Israel. 
Now, before I tell you about the variation with the word schmooze, I want to find out how you understand that word. What does the word schmooze mean? To chat, conversation. Anyone have any other definitions? To suck up to somebody. Okay, so this is a word that is changing. Um, in Yiddish, it means to chat, to gossip. And it is not a transitive verb. You can't schmooze somebody. But in Jewish English, in, well, in English, it is now a transitive verb. You can schmooze somebody. Like I wrote in that quote at the beginning, I spent the party schmoozing up the vice presidents, right? And so it has this meaning of network in addition to chat. And I found that <clears throat> those who say that it has the meaning of to chat are more likely to have a lot of Jewish friends. And they're more likely to be Jewish. So, and we also had non-Jewish respondents on the survey. So this one includes non-Jewish respondents. And you see that non-Jews are less likely to understand it to mean to chat. And they are also, but they are also increasing as they have more Jewish friends in their understanding of this word as chat versus network. Okay, is that clear? Okay, so now I, I've given you some quantitative data. I'm gonna give you some qualitative data, data from a study that I'm doing right now with some colleagues, um, with Jonathan Krasner and Sharon Avni. We are traveling around to Jewish summer camps. I've visited 12 so far, and I've interviewed over 60 people connected with camps. And as part of this project, we're focusing on the use of Hebrew, how different camps use Hebrew, whether it is just a few blessings or an entire Hebrew immersion program. And we found a number of camps that are Hebrew oriented to varying extents. And we also found camps that are oriented toward other languages. So let me explain. First, the Hebrew camps. <clears throat> the Union of Reform Judaism, the reform movement, has several camps around the country. And they do what they call tefillah, um, prayers in Hebrew and shira, singing, and a lot of signs around the camps are in Hebrew, and they use a lot of Hebrew words to refer to places around camp and activities. You get these same kinds of things in Habonim drawer camps, although not much praying because it's a more secular camp, and they also do some announcements in Hebrew, and they have some rituals in Hebrew. Well, they chant a little Hebrew phrase at the end of a, a skit or at the flagpole in the morning. And at B'nai Akiva camps, you have also these same kinds of things. B'nai Akiva is the modern Orthodox religious Zionist movement. And there's little or no transliteration, whereas in a Habonim drawer camp, um, there is a lot of transliteration of Hebrew words. In a B'nai Akiva camp, there's very little transliteration or translation. There's an understanding that the people attend Jewish day schools and will understand the Hebrew. And at, camp, at Ramah camps, which are part of the conservative movement, they do all of these, plus they have a theatrical production in Hebrew. They'll do a musical in Hebrew. Um, and finally, we have several camps that have Hebrew immersion programs where the campers are expected to, well, well they're here, they hear almost only Hebrew and they're expected to speak Hebrew too, including a Mossad camp. It's called Camp Mossad in um, Canada. And Olin Sang Ruby Union Institute, which is a reform camp that has a Hebrew immersion program for 10th graders. And a new camp called Kachol Lavan, meaning blue and white, which is for Israeli-American children. So this is a new addition to the American Jewish scene is a large percentage of Israeli-American families. Okay, so these are the Hebrew camps. Let me tell you a little bit about the other camps that we visited. Um, camp Kindering started out in the 20s as a staunchly secularist, socialist, Yiddishist camp. Now it's not socialist at all. It's a little bit Yiddishist and still pretty secular. Um, but they sing Yiddish songs and they have sometimes um, Yiddish tug where they, the counselors will label things around camp with their Yiddish words. And, um, and they do what they call Stiller Ovent, which is their Friday night celebration. Literally, it means quiet evening. Um, so there is definitely a, a small Yiddish presence at that camp. 
Sephardic Adventure Camp is in the Seattle area, and it's the great-grandchildren of immigrants from Rhodes and Turkey who moved to Seattle, and they want, not they, because they're not around anymore, but their grandchildren want their own children to have, to maintain a connection to their Sephardic identity and to Ladino. So they have Ladino word of the day. One of the days I was there, it, the word of the day was bragas, which means underwear. And so they would come in with underwear on their head and shout, bragas, bragas. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and they also have Ladino songs that they learn, and they have uh, non, nonos and pa, nonos and papus day, which is grandparents' day, where the grandparents would come and teach them Sephardic cooking and some of the Ladino words surrounding that. And finally, I visited Camp Gesher, and it is actually spelled with this backwards R. It's a camp for Russian American Jews. It just started last year. And the, the camp is conducted partly in Russian, with some Hebrew, and mostly English. Okay, so you get a sense of how these different languages are used in camps that have different orientations, right? So these are camps that are trying to socialize the children at the camps to be members of a certain subgroup within the Jewish community, right? And they do this through Jewish English, using these elements that I'm talking about. Let me give you some examples. So at Camp Ramah, I heard this sentence. Boker tov, chanichim. Please go back to your tzrifim, get your big day yam, and then meet at the brecha. So is that an English sentence? Yes, but if you don't know these Hebrew words, it would be hard to understand what you're supposed to do, right? But people at Ramah, quickly learn that chanichim refers to them as campers and srif means bunk and big day yam is swimsuit. So they, they learn these things pretty quickly. Um, on a blog post from Camp Galil, a Habonim drawer camp, it said, at the end of Hit Kansut Boker, the chanichim and madrichim sit in front of the Torah and it, to enjoy a mini hatzaga. Okay, so you see how these words are used similarly in different camps. But the Ramah kids probably wouldn't understand a lot of these words because they don't use the word Torah for, for flagpole and they, don't know, they might not know what hit kansut boker means. Now sometimes these Hebrew words are seen visually around camp. And this goes back to the early days of some of these camps. And here's a picture from Ramah in the 1950s where the chanutia or the canteen was labeled as such. And I don't think you can see it, but the items available at the canteen are also listed in Hebrew. And here is a picture of me doing my research at Camp JCA Shalom at their Gaga pit, which is decorated with Hebrew words. Here's at Camp Kindering. Even in 2013, the, the campers were expected to make these little plaques each year. And even in 2013, they wrote in Yiddish on the plaque. Maybe the kids didn't know Yiddish, but they, got, they found out how to write this one phrase, Yiddish Kultur, Jewish culture. And, and there you see the, the um, songbook that is used at that camp. This is a mechitza, uh, the divider that separates the men and the women in the synagogue at Sephardic Adventure Camp. And you see it has a Hebrew phrase at the top and translations in Ladino and English at the bottom. This was made during color war at the camp. One of the assignments for color war was to make a banner with a rabbinic quote in Hebrew, Ladino, and English. And so they did that, and I think this team won. It was a really nice banner. Um, and their, their camp song includes some Ladino. It's sung to the tune of Eye of the Tiger. Okay, I'll sing, you, I'll sing you a little bit of it. It's the Ojo de Chamsa, we're the king of all camps, having fun and praying with our counselors. And it must be known that the legend lives on, cause we know that S-A-C está muy bueno. So, so you see how they have um, the Ojo de Chamsa, the eye of the, the Chamsa, and um, then a, l a little bit of Ladino, está muy bueno. So, um, and it goes on to talk about yaprakis con arroz. We, we stick together like a yaprakis con arroz, which is um, stuffed grape leaves. Okay, and here's a, a sign from Camp Gesher. Any Russian speakers out there? 
Privet, which means? Privet. Which means welcome, right? Welcome. Yeah. So Camp Gesher has some Russian signs um, and, and some Russian songs. Okay, so now you get a sense of how language is used at these camps and how it is used to express different Jewish identities. We also see this in the realm of politics. How many of you have seen or own buttons or bumper stickers or now apparently iPhone covers of candidates with Hebrew letters? Okay, now sometimes these are puns, like for example, say Cain to Cain, that means yes, to Herman Cain, was that his name? Yeah, um, and uh, here on the bottom, we have uh, Gore and Gornisht, um, <laughs> as in Al Gore, and Gornisht is Yiddish for nothing, um, right? And, and sometimes it's just the Hebrew names of the candidates in, the, the names of the candidates written in Hebrew letters. Now, when somebody has a button or a bumper sticker like this, what do you think their message to the world is? <laughs> right, okay, so that they support this candidate and that they are Jewish, or that it's okay to be Jewish and support the candidate. But not just that they're Jewish, also that they're a specific type of Jew, a Jew who is Jewishly knowledgeable enough to understand the way these Hebrew letters are, um, f form these names. We also see this in region and sports fandom. Um, for example, here we have a Shalom Y'all t-shirt for people who identify with the South and with being Jewish. Um, and then we have Hebrew letters for sports teams. Here we have the Angels and the Yankees. Um, can you think of other examples of how this kind of thing plays out where you have American items with Hebrew letters? Uh-huh, good. Colleges, yeah. Um, does Berkeley have a Berkeley in Hebrew letters shirt? Okay, yeah. Soy ve, yes, okay, right. So you, you, you do see this a lot in advertising products, but that tends to be faux Hebrew lettering. That looks like Hebrew letters, but it's really English letters, right? Any other examples? Oh, right, so that was at the beginning of my presentation. There was a picture of that. Um, exactly, Hebrew uses faux Hebrew letters and uses a lot of Jewish English in its advertising. Very good, very good. So, so here, yeah, Yo Semite, great. So a lot of these involve wordplay, right? Wordplay that understands some degree of comprehension of the words, um, or maybe not. I mean, Yo Semite doesn't involve any Hebrew, right, or Yiddish, um, but they expect that people will understand the, the double entendre or the, um, that kind of wordplay. Right, okay, so the gefilte fish insignia on the, on the bumper that's supposed to look like the Jesus fish, but it says gefilte in it, right? <laughs> okay, good. So let me, let me talk a little bit now about changes, about how some of the words that we use within Jewish English are changing. We talked about schmooze. Um, what about the word schlep? Anyone know how that one is changing? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> to trudge, that's right. It, it used to it used to be transitive, and now it's both transitive and intransitive, because you can say, I slept here all the way from, hey, I don't know, from somewhere far away. And what? Right, but that's schlept zich, right? And so, but the word, you don't have to say, I slept myself. But right, exactly. So in, in the, early, the early days of Jewish English, you would just say, I schlepped the bag all the way up the stairs. But now you say, I schlepped all the way from, and meaning you schlepped yourself, right? So that's one way that it's changing. Also, the word tish, 
Um, in Yiddish, means table. In Jewish English, it doesn't mean table. It means a gathering around a table, a celebration, a chosen's tish, meaning a groom's celebration before the wedding, or a chosid, um, you know, a Hasidic rebbe's tish. Uh, the word bench means to bless in Yiddish. What does it mean in Jewish English? Right, it means to say grace after meals. You can also still use it to say to bench licht, to, to say the blessings over the Hanukkah candles or the Shabbat candles. But often when people say, okay, let's bench, it means to say grace after meals. Chutzpah. What does chutzpah mean? Gall. Nerve. Is it positive or negative? Positive. It depends. It could be positive or negative, right? Um, it's changing. It used to be more negative, and now it's become more positive. Oprah Winfrey had the chutzpah, or probably the chutzpah awards. Um, and it, 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 so this is another example of a word that's changing, especially as it makes its way from primarily Jewish networks to other networks. Okay, so a few other changes. In addition to these words that are changing in their meaning or their usage, we have some Yiddish words that are decreasing, some Yiddish words that are increasing, especially in the religious domain, and some words from textual Hebrew and Aramaic and from Israeli Hebrew that are increasing, that younger people use them more. Now, speaking of young people, we also have an increase in the use of Yiddish in youth culture, which might be surprising because you would think that people would associate Yiddish with old people. But in some elements of Jewish culture that are geared toward young adults, you see a lot of Yiddish. For example, there's this book called Cool Jew, The Ultimate Guide for Every Member of the Tribe. And Lisa Alkali Klug, the author, includes words like shtender and kishkis and bubby and nachis, shul, frum, gornished in the book. And she also includes faux Yiddish trend, um, pronunciations like don't worry. And there's a recurring sidebar called FYI for the Yiddish impaired. <laughs> Similarly, Hebe magazine did this when it was published. Um, there was a section called the whole Megillah and a section called the Nosh Pit instead of the Mosh Pit. Um, and the Nosh Pit was about food and urban kvetch, which was probably a takeoff on the short-lived delivery service in New York called Urban Fetch. And so urban kvetch was a, a section in there. We also see this in The Hebrew Hammer, which was a film from 2003. Have, has anyone seen it? Okay, either you love it or you hate it. Um, I love it because it's great for analyzing language. It's filled with Yiddish words like schlep and bubbleh and Yiddish grammatical constructions like, are you going to eat by us? Or you want I should talk dirty to you? And, um, and notice that intonation. That, that's in there too. You want I should talk dirty to you? Um, and, and you may have what to brag about. And then also these random ch insertions like, the chud instead of the hood, and Hebrew, and I think they even say Cadillac instead of Cadillac at one point. Um, it's just kind of an over the top, it's a parody of black exploitation films, but it's a Jewish version of that. And it's, it's, uh, it, it makes a lot of, I would say, overuse of, of distinctive Jewish language in presenting itself as Jewish and hip. And then we also have a lot of new Yiddish cultural venues that are attracting young people. Classes, summer programs, festivals, especially music, organizations and clubs. And have you guys heard about the Yiddish farm? Yeah, so the Yiddish farm is a farm in upstate New York that brings young people together to, to learn Yiddish. It's a Yiddish immersion environment and to be farmers, to, to farm. One of their biggest crops is garlic. And here you see them farming and also participating in kitchen activities. Um, and so that's another example of Yiddish that is inspiring young people. It was founded by people who actually speak Yiddish, um, at least one of them from his family. And, but it attracts people who are learning Yiddish as a second language. 
We also see a lot of Yiddish-themed books, some of them for children, but I imagine the primary audiences are the grandparents of those children. Um, but there has been a lot of Yiddish-themed publishing in the last few uh, decades. <clears throat> and Jeffrey Chandler writes about this in his book published by UC Press uh, called Adventures in Yiddish Land. Uh, he also writes, writes about a lot of Yiddish material culture, like the kind of thing we were talking about before. There you see that faux Hebrew lettering on the mensch and the oive, uh, no, not the oive, the Yiddish refrigerator magnets. Um, and you see just random Yiddish words placed on a chocolate bar or a stuffed animal that are, that are intended to sell these items, right? This is what I refer to as the commodification of Yiddish. Uh, the commodification, really, of Jewish English. They're selling these items through the language, or they're selling these, the language through the items. So why is this? Why are some young Jews expressing renewed interest in Yiddish language and culture? Any ideas? Yes. Yes. Okay, so because it's in the general sphere, young people would, by nature, be interested in it. Yes? Great. Wow, that's great. That's kind of like how some klezmer musicians got interested in klezmer. They were involved in world music scenes, maybe bluegrass or, or Middle Eastern music, and someone asked them, well, what about your people? Don't they have their own music? And they went and found out that we do. Um, so, so yeah, that's a great example. And so connecting with, the with your own heritage, with your own ancestors. Good. What else? Yeah. Absolutely. So Yiddish as a way of expressing a queer Jewish identity. Good. What else? Yes. Okay, good. So for some Jews who don't feel comfortable in mainstream establishment parts of the Jewish community, partly because of their Israel politics, Yiddish is a way of connecting that doesn't involve Israel. Good. What else? Yes. Yeah, that's right. So their Yiddish is still alive and well in Haredi communities, black hat Orthodox communities, mostly Hasidic. Um, and that, I would say, is a separate phenomenon from this phenomenon of young people reclaiming connection to Yiddish. And in fact, there's very little connection between the two, but increasingly, you're, you're starting to see that a little bit. For example, the Yiddish farm is located right next to um, Kiryas Yol, which is, which is um, a Yiddish enclave in upstate New York, a shtetl, we could call it a shtetl, um, where Yiddish is the main language. It's a Hasidic Satmar um, community where Yiddish is spoken. And so some of these Satmar Hasidim go camping on the grounds of the Yiddish farm. And so there is a little bit of a connection there. There's also, there was this movie called Romeo and Juliet in Yiddish, which was an example of the connection between the two communities. It was made by a woman who, um, well, I'm not sure what her background is, but in the movie, she is writing a master's thesis about Yiddish or something like that, and then she goes to the Hasidic community to make use of their expertise in Yiddish, and so the two, the two worlds intersect in that movie. Yes? Yeah. 
Absolutely. So it, within the Hasidic community, there isn't just this straight usage throughout history, but there are people who are reclaiming Yiddish um, as a part of their Hasidic identity. Absolutely. And there's a really good book that deals with that called Mitzvah Girls by Ayla Fader um, that looks at a Hasidic community and how Yiddish is used in, a, in an interestingly gendered way, that men use it more than women and that it's used for talking to children, especially um, by the women. Okay, so I think you've, you've gotten at a lot of the, the uh, reasons for this, this increase in interest. I would just add a few more um, that, that Jews are feeling increasingly comfortable in America now, whereas the children of immigrants were ashamed of their parents' Yiddish. They're, the great-grandchildren of immigrants are able to then be proud of it and and also, this is a, a historical process in America in general that since the late 60s, there's been an increase in ethnic pride and um, an appreciation for multiculturalism. And so this is Jews, one of the ways that Jews can express this. Okay, so whereas there, the vernacular Yiddish is in decline, it's mostly spoken by older Jews, some Hasidim and other black hat Jews, and small pockets, very small, of young non-Orthodox Jews. Um, the post-vernacular Yiddish is on the rise. Now, post-vernacular is a term by Jeffrey Chandler that refers to the use of a language that is not primarily for communication. So most people who use Yiddish words and go to Yiddish festivals and talk about Yiddish can't actually understand full Yiddish sentences. So that's a great example of post-vernacular Yiddish. And what my colleague Netta Avineri refers to as a meta-linguistic community, meaning a community where the language is valued even if people don't speak it and where elements of it are used. So you might go to a Yiddish-oriented event and the person would get on the stage and say, Sholem Aleichem, and you would respond? Zeir Gut. Okay, so that would be how it would start, right? And um, you get these greetings and these evaluations, and so that's an example of a metalinguistic community. Most of the event will be in English, but the beginning will be framed by Yiddish, and Yiddish will be used for specific purposes. And this is actually pretty similar to how Hebrew is used at many of the summer camps that I talked about and also at Jewish schools. You'll have at a Hebrew school, the teacher will come in and will say, Boker tov, yeladim, and they'll all say, Boker tov, mora, right? And so, so this same kind of call and response exchanges and greetings and evaluations and terms used for specific cultural um, items. Okay, so just as Yiddish is on the decline in its vernacular usage, but on the rise in its post-vernacular usage, we see um, an interestingly, I guess, similar and different trend within Hebrew the knowledge of Hebrew is on the rise in America. And you can see here how there's this age trend. Um, just give you a second to look at that. And then you, this, this is partly a matter of more Israelis in America, but it's also partly because of Jewish education. Here you see how ability to speak at least some Hebrew correlates with attendance at different types of Jewish educational organizations. Uh, those who have no Jewish education are pretty similar to those who have once a week religious school, and those who have twice a week religious school, and then those who attend Jewish day schools. And because there's been an increase in Jewish day school education, there's also been an increase in Hebrew knowledge. Now this doesn't mean that all of those people are fluent in Hebrew or can take a text and analyze it fluently, not at all, but there is at least an increase in the, the exposure to at least some Hebrew. And Israeli Hebrew is having an increased impact on these Jewish educational institutions. Um, throughout the, between the 1920s and the 1970s, 
most American Jewish educational institutions switched over from Ashkenazi Hebrew to Israeli Hebrew in their pronunciation. So saying from saying Sukkot to Sukkot. And um, this had to do with an influx of Israeli teachers in American Jewish educational institutions, but also ideological changes where the synagogue or day school made an effort to switch, made an intentional switch from Ashkenazi to Israeli Hebrew in line with its newfound Zionist orientation or in support of the new state of Israel. Um, and different institutions did it at different times. But in the last few decades, we've also had an increase in the amount of Hebrew used in these institutions, um, partly because of an increase in Israel programs, in people actually going to Israel, um, not only the 10-day birthright Israel program, but also longer-term Israel programs, um, an increasing focus on Hebrew in some Jewish camps, and... Um, and also Israelis, not just in the schools, but also in American Jewish communities. So American Jews are exposed more to Hebrew now than they were in the last few decades. Okay, so I've gone through these three major questions. What is Jewish English? Who speaks it and why? And how it is changing. And I hope now the title of my talk will make a little sense. Mensch, Bench, and Balagan. Mensch is a Yiddish origin word that is used by many American Jews and some non-Jews. And um, it, is used, it is used a little bit less by younger generations than by older ones, but it's still pretty common. Um, and I'll just t tell you a quick story about the word bench. Uh, sorry, mensch. Um, I went to a general assembly which is a um, conference of Jewish organizations at the time when Al Gore was running for president. Would that be 2000? That sounds about right, around 2000. And uh, he uh, was introduced by one of the Federation executives, and he said, I'd like to thank that man for introducing me. We Tennessee Southern Baptists have a name for him. We call him a manch. And so he was using the word mensch, he associated that with the Jewish audience, right? But he kind of distanced himself from the word by highlighting the fact that he's not Jewish. And he maybe even pronounced it in a hyper-Southern way to emphasize his uh, Tennessee Southern Baptist roots. Um, but clearly that is a word that is not only used by a lot of American Jews, but is known outside of the Jewish community. You wouldn't hear Al Gore saying bench or balagan, though. Bench is a, that word we talked about before, meaning to say grace after meals. And it's the kind of word that you would hear more in religious circles among American Jews. And balagan is the kind of word that you would hear among people who have spent time in Israel. So words from Yiddish and from Hebrew are part of Jewish English. And they allow us to show not only that we are Jewish, but also that we are a certain type of Jew. And I'll end with these little um, Greek closings that are used within Jewish English. Zai gesund, from Yiddish, be well, translation of zai gesund. Kol tuv, from Israeli Hebrew. And in Ladino, one would, might say, años munchos y buenos, many good years. And because we're preparing for Passover now, I'll end with a little Jewish English mouse pad that <laughs> says, no chametz zone, have a happy and kosher Pesach, which is a literal, literal translation of chag kasher v'sameach, switched around. Thank you very much. Thank you.